Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about 3D scanning, the technology, the application, the um, challenges, and comparing between the technologies, really. So 3D scanning, some people might call it digitization of our 3D digitization, really, is the process of using one of the 3D scanning technologies, whether it's um, just regular light or um, which you convert it into what we call structure light, the laser technology, the um, photogrammetry or the contact base using CMM machines. If you use any of these to basically uh, acquire a um, representation of the object's external surface that is really 3D scanning. And you might say, why should I convert the physical object into its, um, let's say, surface representation, external surface representation, or it's uh, in more advanced thing, it's CAD model, right? Well, there are so many applications. One is, Sometimes uh, there are some existing parts that you uh, do not have the CAD models for anymore and you want to do some analysis on them. Sometimes you want to uh, create replicates of them, right? So by engineering analysis, there are so many different things. For example, you want to get a CAD model of them and then import them into an analysis software like, for example, ANSYS or some stress analysis, thermal analysis, and so on, and see what is going to happen to the part in simulation if so much of uh, forces, torques, uh, temperature, and so on applied, right? Sometimes your goal is just to replicate it because the part does not have a CAD model uh, the part, or maybe the part is not being uh, produced anymore and you need it, or maybe it's just a component of a machine and the rest of the machine is working. This one does not, and um, it's not easy, sometimes impossible, to buy that component. You have to buy the entire machine or a big part of the machine, and that is really costly. So if you can reverse it, really you can save a lot of money. Right, and by reversing means converting it into a CAD model, and then from that CAD model, you can create replicates of the part. There is uh, what we call industrial optical metrology. So this uh, science of metrology is different from what you um, know about the uh, science of weather, right? that is not exactly uh, written this way and not pronounced this way, right? So it has an extra E and O. Meteorology, and that's the science of weather. This is metrology. The metrology comes from the word meter or measure. Okay, and this is the science of measuring parts very accurately, consistently, correct? And... Uh, using tools, coming up with tools for uh, appropriate and effective measurement, accurate measurements. So this is like the measuring science. Uh, for example, what's one of the applications? Well, one of the applications is this. You um, design a part and the manufacturer has manufactured the part. And now you want to know whether the manufacturer has uh, observed all of the tolerances and everything. And the manufacturer part is really uh very close to what you really intended as the designer so the matter of fact is measuring some features on a manufacturer part using some of the tools that we know like uh, micrometers calipers and so on is sometimes possible but there are some features on some parts that if you want to check their tolerances and everything and make sure that they are basically what we call in spec, the part is in spec, the only way to go about it is using a scanner. And um, that's where the scanner comes into play, comparing the actual part versus the design or the CAD model and see whether they are close or not and the tolerances are good. 
So another thing could be cultural and historical heritage preservations. If there are some uh, like um, old antique stuff, some historic stuff, buildings, parts, and so on, and if you want to uh, preserve their shape, their texture, and any info color and something, you can scan them, right? So if anything happens to them in the future, you have all of the uh, information. If you want to, let's say, do a reconstruction on them, repair them, right, or anything for that matter, it's a good idea to keep the geometry, the texture, the color, and everything, right? Uh, there are, and uh, the same thing can be used for a forensic science. This is where the people in the forensic science, they can use scanners to look at like footprints, fingerprints, and so on. Although fingerprints are not really easy uh, to get with a scanner or something, but footprints definitely uh, can be scanned and then uh, they can be used to uh, do some uh, crime analysis and so on. And medical application is these days one of the biggest customers of 3D scanners. They use them for cosmetics, they use them for prosthetics, they use them for dental applications. Okay, for example, you probably, uh, some of you have seen that doctors these days, they use their uh, dental scanners when they want to make uh, a crown or they want to make the sleep apnea devices, right, SADs, then uh, the way that they uh, basically create a model of your gums and teeth is using a, a teeth 3D scanner, really, that's what they use. And they're trying to replace uh, the impressions that they used to take from our teeth Still, many of them are using impressions, but these days, many doctors are using technology because it's much, much faster to get the very accurate model of your teeth using a scanner than uh, using uh, impressions. Because impressions need physical parts, right? You have to make those impressions, uh, molds, put it in the person's mouth. It's not comfortable. They have to stay in a fixed position. You get their uh, impressions and then you have to send it to the labs so they can make, let's say, a crown or something. And uh, when you're transferring those uh, uh, impressions from your dental office to those labs, there is a chance that these impressions get damaged or something, right? And there is a chance that he, the technician who is creating these impressions from the person's teeth does not do a good job or the person moves or anything for that matter. Transferring physical parts is not as easy as just creating a digitized scan of the person's uh, mouth, teeth, gums, and then just emailing the labs that are going to make the crowns this digital model, right? And then using CAD, they can also uh, basically create crowns or uh, anything that they want and then create the parts using their CNC machines. You probably have seen some doctors that not only they have their uh, dental scanners, they also have in the same office, they have a CNC machine. And in that CNC machine, they have a block of ceramics, a block uh, that has the initial material for the um, uh, crown. And then uh, the processing software takes the scan model uh, design a uh, crown, pass it to the CNC machine, and they can get you the crown very fast. So instead of you taking an impression, coming back a week or two weeks after, so hopefully you get the, the um, crown made by the um, lab, right? And then they check it, and then they have to reprocess it and make sure they finally fit in, into your mouth. They can do that within a few hours just using their technology. So um, they can, you can use it for uh, prosthetics. Uh, there are some cases that I have seen like a person lost a portion of their body, right? And they are trying to scan the rest of that limb that is left and they come up with a prosthetic to um, 
basically uh, give the person's uh, body better appearance. I have seen people lost a part of their face and they had printed jaws. I have seen people with uh, basically lost limbs in the leg and so on getting prosthetics. So this um, uh, 3D scanning is a big, big advantage to the medical branch. And then, of course, virtual reality and animation, right? So here you can see the person is using this Scan Pro Plus, uh, scanning the Super Mario, and then using that CAD model uh, into a virtual reality. So 3D scanning is a big new technology. And uh, everybody, including uh, myself in our lab, we are using it. So now you might say, how do you convert your part into a digital model? There are different technologies. Uh, the most common one, which is most of the time also one of the cheapest ones, is called structured light. So the structured light, what it does, you have one light projector and a couple of cameras. And what this projector does, it basically shines a structured light on the surface. Most of the time, this structure light is a bunch of parallel lines, like a barcode. And then, if you shine these parallel lines on a part that is perfectly flat, there is no ups or no downs. If you shine these parallel lines to that object with no ups and downs, then parallel lines, they stay perfectly parallel on the surface, and you can see that in your cameras that there is no distortion, there is no change in the distance between the parallel lines. However, if the surface has ups and downs, now the parallel lines will be distorted. So in some places, the gap between them is increased. In some other places, the gap between them is uh, basically shrinking. And uh, the amount of this distortion of these lines from parallel original pattern this is proportional to the uh, basically amount of uh, elevation of the surface at that point. How much that point is above the uh, base of the surface or how much it is below the base of the surface. So the amount of this height elevation here of that point does change the amount of distortion of parallel lines. So by uh, converting the amount of distortions to uh, heights, you can come up with the um, interpretation of the surface topology. Now, when it comes to structure light, there are two types of uh, lights or uh, technologies that you hear. One of them is white light. The other one is blue light. Most of the time, uh, you might use a white light because white light is a little bit cheaper. But if you use a blue light, which is more advanced and is more uh, accurate, then you're going to get some advantages, right? So um, most of the time, as I said, the blue light, or always, the blue light technology is more expensive than white, and there is a reason for that. There is a reason blue light is uh, more expensive and is preferred, and is outdating the white light technology these days, because it has several advantages. What are they? White light, you know, the white light is uh, the combination of all different wavelengths, the, the combination of all different colors. So it's kind of the entire uh, visible spectrum of the light. And when that's the case, it is going to be easily or much easier affected by any, um, basically, reflections of surfaces, any external... Uh, ambient light or anything that is going to um, interfere with this uh, spectrum and make the uh, pattern of light to either not reflect well, right, scatter, or to uh, be easily distorted. Blue light has only one wavelength, blue, and blue has a short wavelength. And the shorter the wavelength is, the harder it is to uh, basically uh, scatter that light. So in general, the blue light cannot be uh, as easily uh, 
distorted or scattered as you can do it with the white light because it has a single wavelength and that is a short wavelength white light has all different types of wave wavelength the other one is when you want to use a scanner you have to warm the scanner up so uh, they can do their job properly and the white light it needs a lot more energy to get warm so when it does, it's going to be a lot warmer than a blue light that typically runs on LEDs. Right? So you have to spend more energy to make the white light warm. And that means the life, the lifespan of that the scanner is going to go down. So uh, blue lights, typically they uh, last longer, their scanners, than a white light. And also because they don't get as warm as the white light, then the thermal noise that will affect the quality of your um, pictures perceived by the cameras is going to be far less compared to the white light okay so um, you're not going to get as much thermal noise in a blue light scanner versus a white light and finally uh, because the white light, as I said, is the um, entire visible uh, spectrum, right? And uh, also, um, the light sources in most of the labs, in most of the environments that you do the scanning, they are kind of white or yellowish white or something similar to the white light than to a blue light it has more overlap and it has more interference with the ambient light okay so that's the problem the ambient light because they are more similar in terms of color to a white light they will ruin the quality of the images uh, received in the cameras much more than a blue light scanner that is just one wavelength. Most of the time, the lights in a room are not blue lights. Okay, so the ambient light is going to affect uh, the blue, uh, the uh, white light a lot more. So three factors, right? The more uh, energy and being warmer, so means more thermal noise. Being closer to the lights in the ambient, in the environment, white light uh, will be affected more. And also the fact that it has several frequencies and wavelengths that they can be uh, affected more, distorted or scattered more, compared to a single short wavelength blue light. So if you can get a blue light scanner at a reasonable price, you definitely want to consider that compared to a white light scanner. But most of the time, the... the price difference between them is quite meaningful. So uh, this is the structure white light. Then we go to, that's the first technology. We go to laser triangulation technology, which is kind of similar to the white light. The base of the technology is similar. Okay, but it uses laser. And um, what you really need is a, a single camera and a single laser head. You don't need uh, two cameras or something. Now here you might say, well, you have two laser heads. No, not really. Uh, it's just one, but since the part is on a turntable here, the way that it is drawn is to show you that the laser head will be at different relative angles with respect to the part okay so as you can see it's just uh, one laser a laser a laser right that's the same laser so you really need one laser and one camera but your laser has a, a sender and it has a receiver and you can put the parts on a, a turntable uh, we do the same thing for a uh, white uh, structure light too many of them do have turntables and as I said, instead of um, blue light or white light, it uses laser. And uh, the base of the uh, technology is the same. The amount of um, elevation, the amount of uh, change in the height from a base, which here is shown by D, that will basically 
uh, is proportional to the um, angle or the change in the angle of the laser lights perceived in the uh, camera. So here, if you see, the same laser is shining, is being uh, shined on three layers at different heights, different uh, elevations. And when they reflect back into the camera receiver, they are coming at three different angles, right? So if the base here is the blue, which let's say it goes um, right at the center of the camera, optical center, right? Or along the uh, optical axis Z, then depending on whether the surface I'm trying to scan is above that base or below that base, I will get deviations to the left or to the right side of that center. So here the red goes to the left, which is above, and then green, which is below, goes to the right. And the amount of this uh, deviation on the left or right of the center, this D prime, is linearly proportional to the height difference from that point to the base. So this D prime is proportional to D, okay? And then, so using that, um, you can infer the relative positions of different points that are uh, basically being measured. Good. And uh, you can see here also, uh, most of the time, it's not really one single laser point, right? The laser is not just shining and targeting a specific point. They are typically using lines and so it is kind of similar to the structure light and again you can see here if these two laser uh, beams are parallel when the surface is what as you can see here when the surface is flat like here they stay parallel right let me see if i can use a thinner um, marker so when the surface is flat, they stay parallel. When the surface is not flat, like this area, you clearly see that these two parallel beams of laser, now they deviate, their distances is changing, right? And so this amount of deviation does depend on how high that area in the surface is, okay? So you clearly see that um, deviation here. Now, uh, you might say, well, that is almost the same as your uh, structure light. You are right. In terms of base technology, that's the same thing. Uh, and you might say, well, so why laser? Well, laser has its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, the fact is, um, the laser scanners, and we are going to compare laser scanners against the structure light, but uh, they tend to be a little bit cheaper than the structure light scanners. They cannot uh, do as many scans or as many uh, points that they collect as the structure white light. So these beams of laser are not as many as the structure lights that you can see here. So the amount of time it takes them to scan is not basically as fast as the structure. They don't collect as many points as the structure light does. But the good thing with the laser is it can travel a larger distance before being uh, significantly affected by the environment's light, ambient light. So if the object to be scanned is not very close to your uh, scanner, then the laser can do a much better job compared to structure light. When you do structure light, the object that you're scanning has to be very, very close to the scanner. Okay? But for lasers, these guys, they typically what? Uh, they can scan a little bit uh, further objects. That's just one of the differences. There is another way that you can use laser and uh, again uh, infer the 3D structure of the part and based on that's based on time of flight. Some people might call it it's a, a laser pulse 3D scanning technology. And as I said, this is really based on the uh, time of flight. 
So if you send a laser beam to an object and then it goes back to the receiver, if you can uh, look at this um, time that it took for the light beam to be emitted from here and then to be received back from here, and if these two uh, source and receiver are almost at the same location, which for most of the scanners, they are right in one head, then you can say this distance I have from my scanner to the object is going to be one half of the total distance traveled by the light. And the total distance traveled by the light is basically the speed of the light, which is almost 300 um, million meters per second times the travel time. So if I can say, hey, if this is T of zero, T1 of zero, this T2, when the light is received, if I can measure that, and if I can say the uh, total distance traveled is L, and I want just this distance D, this is also D, then 2D, the total distance traveled, is going to be the speed of light C times T2 minus T1. And if I know T1, which is 0, if I know C, and if I can measure T2, then I can get D by dividing both sides by 2. And the matter of fact is, you might say, well, the light is super fast, and the distances that you typically have are not very large distances. So the difference, time difference between T1 and T2 should be a very small fraction of time, right? And the answer is yes. Uh, these um, uh, time of flight scanners, uh, the time between T1 and T2 can be measured in picoseconds. <clears throat> okay, and pico means 10 to the negative 12 of a second, right? So we have milli, micro, nano, and pico. So they have circuits that can measure as small as 10 to the negative 12 of a second, one uh, basically trillionth of a second. And that's enough for that fast speed to uh, travel some distance. And again, because of the nature of laser, this technology can easily be used to uh, basically uh, scan objects that are at the larger distance, but definitely not super suitable for larger scans. The LiDAR, which is a laser rangefinder, also works based on this technology, LiDAR, which the police is using for traffic control and checking the speed of your car when you're driving. That is also based on this technology. They just use it to uh, get um, the distance from you, and then they do that measurement in two times, then divide your total distance traveled by the time to get a uh, approximation of your speed. So uh, the other technology is called photogrammetry. This is basically using a bunch of cameras for each, you know their position and you know their orientation with respect to a fixed reference frame. And then uh, they all take the pictures of the object to be scanned in one fraction of a second. So the important thing here for all of these camera is to be synced. They have to be synchronized. So you need special uh, systems to make sure that the shots by all of these cameras are done at the exact same time. And if it's the case, then you see, for example, here, this person, you see different pictures of this person from different angles are taken. And then by combining all of those pictures from different angles with known camera positions and orientations, you can use uh, the, um, we call multi-view uh, geometry approximation, okay? So this is called multi-view. Uh, surface reconstruction, if you want the uh, uh, technical term, multi-view surface 
reconstruction. This is a topic in computer vision. I will soon launch my videos on computer vision and image processing. I'm going to talk about this. There is some amount of math behind it. But if you can use computer vision and computational geometry algorithms using all of these pictures, you can easily make the 3D model of the part. And typically, they are very accurate. The thing is, having all of these good cameras at the same time taking a snapshot is quite an expensive set of uh, equipment. They are not easily portable. They cannot just hold them like a scanner and move them around. But the best thing about them is, uh, like other scanners, you don't need to use a turntable and then uh, keep moving. If it's a person, you ask the person not to move at all, not to blink, not to do anything because the scan can go bad. All you need is just a fraction of a second. So it's mostly these days used for um, really uh, luxury applications like... For example, they want to make a, a set of wedding statues or something like that. Then the two people, one person goes inside that chamber, the shots are taken, and then they use these uh, 3D printers with the specific material like plasters, powders, and they get you some very fancy with color and texture um, statues. And they are not cheap, okay? A small thing of these I have seen, it ranges about $1,000 or so. So because uh, the processing, the software, the equipment is very expensive. And finally, we have the contact base uh, technology, which here you have a, a touch probe. And the touch probe is going to uh, come into minimal contact with the uh, surface of the object. And it is going to uh, touch the surface of the object at as many points as you want. And uh, then it tries to give you the position X, Y, Z of that point that it touched, right? So it can give you um, basically some measurements. Now, most of the time, this contact-based technology, the uh, most well-known ca category of it is what we call coordinates measuring machines or CMM machines that is used in industry, a machine like this, they are not really to scan the entire surface of the object. Because if you want to move your points all over the object and touch each and every one of the points, it's going to take a lot of time. So what they typically use it for is for areas that the light might not easily reach, internal holes and cavities where the light cannot easily reach and you are not going to get a good picture of the deformation of the light. So it is amazing for those areas. It can complement your 3D scanner. Most of the time you use them to check whether a part is made to the specs, to the tolerances. So most of the time these machines are used for checking the tolerances uh, instead of making a 3D model of the object. As I said, you are going to sample the part at a bunch of points. You cannot touch each and every one of the points. Okay? So, uh, but they have some advantages. The, the touch probe can go and touch areas that your light might not be able to touch and uh, uh, go there. So, these are the five major technologies. Under the third category, it says laser pulse technology. There is also a category called laser uh, phase shift, which is also um, based on the time of the travel, but also uh this laser pulse sent to the object and received is modulated and they not only look at the time of the travel they look at the phase shift between the send laser beam and the received laser beam and that is also being used to uh infer the 3d geometry of the part because it turns out this uh, phase shift is a robust measurement of uh, the topology of the surface of the part. So uh, that's also a complementary technology used in laser scanners. 
So, uh, so far we have seen applications and technologies. Before I jump into challenges, this table here gives you a brief uh, comparison between these technologies, pros and cons of each one. So for a structured light, if I want to go very fast, a structured light can be very accurate. They can get a, uh, basically fast scans. They can capture lots of points on the surface of the object. They can capture color. They can capture geometry because they have cameras. The light is uh, structure light scanners are portable and there is a wide range of prices available for them you can go as low as below a thousand dollars for them to very expensive one like zeiss and kians that are like a hundred thousand dollars and a little bit more okay so there is a wide range of prices depending on what technology and what is the accuracy the resolution of the scanner then you'll get a wide range of prices. So if you're a hobbyist or if you're a pro looking at the surface roughness of some object, even you're looking into resolutions of nano inches or so, you still have scanners with this technology. Most of the time or almost all of the time, blue light technology. What are the bad things with them? The ambient light can affect their performance, especially if it's white light, definitely. So one of the suggestions is if you are doing the scanning, make sure the room in which you are doing the scanning is, um, if you can make it a little bit dark, right? Turn off the lights and let the uh, light of the scanner, not make it really dark, but um, reduce the amount of ambient light so the light of the scanner is the dominant light. Um, it's, most of them work in two modes, in a, a turntable mode and in a handheld mode. And um, the handheld modes are used when the part to be scanned is very large and you cannot easily fit it on a turntable. Then if it's large or heavy, you use handheld. The problem is when you use handheld the uh, accuracy of the scan drops compared to when it's stationary on a turntable. Um, if there are surfaces that are reflective or transparent, you need to do pre-processing. And what do I mean by that? So if the part you are scanning is shiny, like a metal surface, or if it's transparent, like let's say glass or something, something transparent, the structure light, even not the laser technology, both of them will fail because the light is going to pass through or it's going to be um, reflected back in a way that is not appropriate for the cameras to capture, right? It's going to be a specular reflection versus like Lambertian um, reflection of the light. And uh, that makes capturing a good uh, scan getting a good scan almost impossible. So the solution for such uh, surfaces is to use what we call the uh, CAD CAM sprays. This sprays, uh, these sprays, they are a very, very thin uh, powder that is like paint and you can spray it on the object and they make the uh, part opaque. And when the part is opaque, you can easily scan it. And the good thing with these uh, sprays is you can easily wash them. Okay. And if these sprays are not available, you can use baby powders. You can just make the uh, part a little bit uh, barely uh, wet. And then very gently and carefully apply a very, very thin layer of baby powder to the object to make it opaque. Okay, you want something that does not change the surface of the object and is easily washable. Okay, but these CAD CAM sprays are not really expensive. We use them all the time. The biggest challenge I would say is the light cannot reach deep and internal cavities holes of the part. And that's the same for laser. Okay, it cannot go and reach the areas of the part that there are big cavities or holes. And that's where you have to use those uh, contact-based technologies. So for laser also, uh, many problems are similar. 
So I did not repeat them here under cons, but um, uh, if the surface is transparent or uh, reflective, you have the same problem. The laser cannot also reach the holes. So these two problems basically also exist for the um, laser scanners. Both problem also are faced. So um, I can add them for you here. But they also have other things about the cons. They are expensive, and when we say expensive, it depends. If it's triangulation, and if it's the time of the flight, because here uh, we are talking about triangulations. Triangulations, some of them are expensive, but most of the time they are not really that expensive. The time of the flight ones are more expensive, okay? If you want a good LiDAR, they are quite a bit expensive. So uh, here, I should not just say laser triangulation. I should also say pulse as well. And this expensiveness is mostly for the pulse technology because they can scan parts at a large distance. Another problem exists for them is dark objects that absorb the laser and do not reflect back well. Scanning those parts could be hard. Uh, the density of the scan is not comparable to the white or blue light technology. Structure light, because you don't have as many uh, laser beams as you have with uh, structure light, so you're not going to get dense scans. And it turns out they are not even as accurate as the structure light. Okay, so if you really want to choose between these two technologies, structure light and laser, I would definitely go with the structure light because it gives you options and the ran different ranges of uh, accuracy, but most of them are way more accurate and way more dense. They give you a lot more points on the surface of the object compared to the laser, and they have a big range of prices available. But uh, you see here when it says reasonable prices, and you might say, well, reasonable prices is different from expensive. So I have to say reasonable prices is for the laser triangulation technology and expensive is for the pulse technology, really. So no confusion, hopefully. Uh, and here you see it says does not collect a lot of points. But on the other hand, you see that does not collect lots of points is a con, but also is mentioned as a pros. So which one? It depends on your application. If you really need a very, very... A dense approximation of the surface then definitely the fact that they do not give you that dense scan that's a bad thing sometimes you do not really need a huge amount of points right and you just want a sparse scan you don't want tons and tons of points then this might be an advantage so it depends on what your application needs most of the time it's not really an advantage because if you collect a lot of points, you can always do what we call downsampling. You can always downsample your scan, or let's say in Katia, you call it decimation of the scan file or the mesh file. Okay, so getting more points is uh, always has a solution. You can uh, reduce a number of points and regenerate the surface of the object. Re do the tessellation one more time but if you don't have enough points generating those is not easy uh, the best thing about them is they are not uh, susceptible to the ambient light because the laser is really coherent and it's not affected too much by the ambient light as much as structure light and uh, they are also portable like a structure light another good advantage as I told you is they can work in large distances that's a big thing, okay? If you cannot have the object as a close, at a close distance, like you want to do scan with the LiDAR or something, then the option to go with is laser. You cannot use a structured LiDAR scanner and check the speed of a car driving, okay? So um, all depends on the application. The contact base, like the CMM machine, as I said, the CMM machines, uh, they have, again, pros and cons. 
The pros is they can reach areas that these two previous scanners cannot reach. That's their most important advantage. And they are also very accurate, really accurate. The cons is most of the time they are extremely expensive. CMM machines are not cheap. They are very expensive. They need a bunch of training in order to run them, and running them is a slow process because you have to touch the point and then uh, make sure the contact is right and then go to the next point. They do not capture lots of data, of course, because they are very slow and it's based on touch, and most of the time they are not portable. Most of the CMM machines are large, bulky machines, and they are meant to stay in the factory. And finally, the photogrammetry is depends on what you want to do with it. If they are app-based, they are very cheap. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, if you go and look at the um, uh, app store on your cell phone and look for um, basically 3D reconstruction software, photogrammetry software, then you see there are a bunch of applications that you can easily find on your cell phones. And all you need to do is to move your cell phone around the object to be scanned. And your camera collects all of these different pictures. And then that software, that app, tries to uh, get you a 3D model of that part. So yes, there are many free software on your cell phones that you can do this. The problem is they are not really that accurate. Because they are working based on your camera. Uh, on the cell phone, which could be relatively good, but the, the way that they find the angles of your uh, camera in the different, uh, when you go around the objects, right? So you're holding your camera and you go around the object and then taking all of these uh, pictures, the way that that app knows the position and orientation of the camera in each one of these uh, uh, basically snapshot positions is mm -hmm. using the gyroscope and using the accelerometer in your camera. So if your camera does not have gyro or accelerometer, these apps are not going to work. But you know, accelerometers and gyros have drift problems. They have accuracy problems, okay, when they use the loan. And so it's not like this case where the cameras are in a fixed position and orientation all the time and you exactly know where they are. Okay, so because it's a mobile device and it's not super accurate measurements of its angles and position, those apps are not going to give you a very good 3D model. If you want to use a professional setting like, as I said, these cameras, then the cost is going to be extremely um uh, large it's not going to be cheap at all okay very very expensive extremely expensive i know that most of the times the setup the initial setup for such photogrammetry systems easily exceeds two to three hundred thousand dollars okay so that's a pro and a con uh, they allow larger scans, as much as inside that chamber you can uh, squeeze, you can probably scan. Uh, they are hard to perform. You need to know computer region. You need to work with software. And uh, getting that 3D model is not easy. You need good training. They are relatively accurate. Uh, they need specialized software and hardware, as I said, which kind of translates to this being expensive. Now, two good advantages for this uh, technique is drones can be used for it. So many times you want to take basically the model of some large object, like a building, like a tree, like something, and um, you cannot take a, a handheld scanner and try to scan the whole building. It's not, it's not practical. You cannot do that. So what you can do is you can use the pictures captured by the camera on the drone. You can fly the drone all over the building, take those pictures, bring them into a software, and then create a 3D model. They're not going to be as accurate as a handheld scanner, but that's the only way to uh, make it happen. 
okay and the best thing about this method is it can uh, generate the 3d model with just one shot in a fraction of a second so the person is going to be able to move after a second right as i said when you do it with the handheld scanner the person has to be extremely stationary if they even blink it can ruin their scan but with this it's just one snapshot all of them take especially with this as i said this setup of uh, all cameras and then you're good to go now if you use your cell phone or a drone that's a separate story the object might move in between all of these uh, snapshots but if you do it all at the same time as i said with the setup of camera it's very fast and typically very accurate finally what are the uh, 3d scanning challenges so i mentioned the transparent or semi-transparent surfaces and I told you that you can use basically um, the uh, CAD CAM sprays. The other thing is, uh, even when you use, let's say, structure light or a laser scanner, especially structure light that captures lots and lots of points, most of the time hundreds of thousands or millions of points in uh, each scan, or in several scans the matter of fact is you cannot capture the whole geometry of the part right because if you look here for example only this uh, upper surface of the object is visible to the cameras so if you want to see what's on the bottom surface of the object then what would you do you need to when you're done with the scan of the top surface you need to turn the part over and then look at the bottom portion of it, then probably look on the front of it, the back of it. And so you need several sets of scans. And then you have to somehow merge all of these several sets of scan together to come up with the complete geometry of the part. And that's not necessarily an easy job. Many of the software for scanners try to do that using visual features. So what they try to do is let's say if I look at this specific uh, line or edge and I can see that in a top scanner in top view scan and I can also see let's say on the uh, another angle right then by matching these uh, points they try to find the matrix that basically called the homography matrix and it can um, relate the points in one picture to another picture and once they can estimate this uh, homography transition matrix then they can um, transform all of the other points on the surface and they can uh, what we call um, merge all of these scans together but in general that's not an easy job Sometimes when the algorithm of this uh, software uh, packages fail to find those common points between different uh, pictures or different views, they ask you to manually locate some points in, let's say, the first scan and the second scan where these points refer to the same 3D object or 3D feature. And depending on how good you can click on those two points which refer to the same feature then they try to calculate the homography matrix and if your uh, points that you clicked on are not exactly the same point then there is a good chance that you get uh, some overlaps of the two scans in some areas and some cavities in some other areas and you get a bad merging of the scans so the merging is not really an easy job. The scanning, as I said, cannot go and take care of the deep holes, right? And the features, and that's where you have to use the uh, contact machine. So if you have a combination of a CMM machine and a 3D scanner, let's say with the structure light, then you probably can scan almost the entire object and uh the other thing is if the scanners especially laser and structure light if you use them with the turntable they are typically way more accurate than in the handheld mode so if your object is big is large heavy you cannot put it on the turntable 
you have to resort to the handheld mode and when you do you are going to lose some accuracy and finally there is always a trade-off between fast scanning and handling large number of points okay because when you are scanning the object if the area that you are scanning is a small area right so then the density of the points is going to be what is going to be a lot higher and since the area is small you can probably uh, do the scan a little bit faster right so you see i can go with faster speed but at the same time the area that i'm scanning is small if i have to scan a larger area now the density of the point goes down a little bit and since it's a large area the scanner needs to do more work so when the, uh, the scanned area goes up the speed goes down as well as the density of the points and there is always a trade-off you cannot make both of them to be perfectly amazing right because you have so much uh, computing power you have so much uh, angle of view on the cameras and so much technical difficulties that you can resolve and uh, basically handle so um, hopefully this um, video was useful to you about what is 3d scanning technologies comparison of technologies and some challenges Okay, before I finish the video, just wanted to show you the picture of the dental scanner because I mentioned it. I wanted you to see the picture of the dental scanner. So these are the scanners that these days doctors and people who are um, basically specialists in sleep apnea treatment are using to get the uh, uh, internal structure of your mouth, gum, teeth, and everything. And that is way more accurate, way faster than any type of impression. So hopefully this video was useful to you and I will see you in my next lecture. Thank you.